Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to Ms. Lacey Lofton. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm excited about this presentation that Chris Martin is going to be giving us on um, American Indian and Alaska Native research. Um, he, there's nobody better to cover these topics for us. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, as Ted mentioned, this is being recorded. We will also be transcribing it and posting both the transcription and the recording on our website, hopefully in the next week or two. So um, you can always come back and ask us it that way. We are also going to be doing Q&A through the chat. If you have questions while Chris is going through his presentation, please put them in the chat. And after he's completed the entire thing, we will go back and, and ask those questions that were sent that way. Um, Chris Martin is a historian with the U.S. Census Bureau, and he has a lot of responsibilities. It's an impressive list. He is in charge of the history of the American Community Survey. He is in charge of the history of the 2020 Census, which is one that is for the record books. Um, and he's also in charge of the Alumni Biography Program. He previously worked with the Documents Compass at the University of Virginia on the people of the founding era digital database. Um, he also worked on the database at Mount Vernon's enslaved community, I'm sorry, of Mount Vernon's enslaved community at George Washington's Mount Vernon. He was also an interpreter at James Madison's Montpelier, and he lives near the Census Bureau um, headquarters in Washington, D.C., with his wife, son, and two dogs. And with that, Chris, can you hear me? Are you ready? I'm ready. Excellent. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for doing this today. And thank you very much, Lacey. When researching American Indian genealogy, many people rely on the Indian census rolls compiled yearly by the Bureau of Indian Affairs between 1885 and 1940, and the Dawes rolls compiled by the American Dawes Commission in varying degrees between 1893 and 1914. In addition to these valuable records, the United States Census Bureau has also conducted several censuses of American Indians that can be a useful resource for those interested in exploring history and genealogy. Census Bureau records are also a valuable resource for those interested in researching Alaska Native history and genealogy as well. One quick note, some of the terms used in historic census reports and forms are outdated. However, we feel it is disingenuous and impractical to omit these terms when quoting or referencing census resources in a historic context especially considering the role the census has played as diverse groups form and change identities throughout American history. The Census Bureau values your privacy and will never release your personal information. However, the National Archives may release this information to the public after 72 years. Please understand that when discussing historical material, the sources must be viewed through the context of the times in which the information was collected and produced. The Census has been part of the United States since the ratification of the Constitution in 1789. It is one of the foundations of the United States government, which depends on the Census to allocate voting power and resources evenly based on population. Several changes have been made since 1789. The three-fifths clause for all other persons, meaning enslaved persons, was overturned by the 14th Amendment. The 1929 Reapportionment Act set the limit of the House of Representatives at 435, which eliminated the population totals required for each House seat and led to the introduction of the Huntington Hill apportionment method in 1941. And Indians not taxed, meaning those who lived on reservations or in tribal relations outside of white and black settlements, would be nullified by a decision of the Attorney General just prior to the 1940 census, as the AG decided, supported by President Roosevelt, that at this point all American Indians and Alaska Natives in some way fell under U.S. jurisdiction. Only the head of household's name was recorded until 1850. This means that unless you're looking for statistics at the household level or for the head of the household, most searches will start in 1850 for individuals depending on their geography and social factors. As I mentioned in the previous slide, this does not apply to enslaved persons who were excluded until 1870, and many of those considered Indians not taxed until 1940. Additionally, until 1960 or 1970, depending on where you lived, an enumerator came to each household and filled out the form based on their interpretation and observation, meaning some things like race, spellings of names, and non-traditional occupations did not get recorded accurately, but according to the enumerator's interpretation. In some cases, such as with light dates, it is the respondent that frequently misstates important dates. 
Even now, newborn babies are commonly forgotten to be included by the head of household when filling out census forms. Several of these difficulties are amplified in the American Indian and Alaska Native communities. For example, languages were far more diverse and more difficult for enumerators to record on their forms as directed, and even harder to represent in the statistics of the final reports. Additionally, the census relied on Western measurements of years and time, which could lead to confusion about dates and life dates for American Indian and Alaska Native respondents. And finally, as I mentioned before, the final reports and even the schedules themselves reflect the politics and environment of the time, and the statistics and quality of the reports improved greatly as our nation progressed. Due to the instructions of the Constitution, the first six censuses omitted almost entirely any information on American Indians, save those who did not live on reservations or in tribal communities, and they were listed as white or other free people. For the seventh census of the United States, conducted in 1850, the superintendent of the census asked the Commissioner of Indian Affairs to provide account of the various tribes and populations under his supervision, the final report is seen here. A provision for counting American Indians in the race color category first appeared in the census of 1860 for those who had renounced tribal affiliation and lived with settler communities or in large eastern cities. Although the final report only devoted one page to the subject, similar to that of 1850. Francis Amasa Walker, the former and superintendent of Indian Affairs and the superintendent responsible for the 1870 and 1880 censuses, expanded the scope and professionalism of the census office at that time. He also tried to expand the census to include American Indians in 1870, even in including instructions to census marshals. However, the census office did not receive the necessary funding for the compilation of a final report on American Indians. Even though the enumeration of American Indians took up about the same amount of space as the two previous decades in the 1870 final report, it showed a much greater depth of analysis. I would like to highlight the 1850 to 1870 New Mexico territorial censuses, which also included Arizona at that time, and they were part of the decennial censuses. Due to the frontier nature and Spanish tradition of intermixing with local populations, these schedules provide a greater opportunity to find enumerated American Indians. Although the indication of race is often unreliable, many American Indians are unlisted or listed as non-white. The racial designation of inhabitants of Taos Pueblo, for example, is copper in the 1850 census and Indian in the 1860 and 1870 censuses. This makes using these records for anything beyond targeted individual research more difficult. In 1880, the Census Bureau conducted a special census of American Indians as part of the decennial count for reservations in three Western territories and states. Section 8 of the Census Act of March 3, 1879, authorized the Census Bureau to enumerate all Indians not taxed, that is, those on reservations or in areas unsettled by white or black Americans. With the budget provided, the Census Bureau undertook enumerations in Washington Territory, Dakota Territory, and California. The Census Bureau used a special Indian population schedule containing 48 questions. Enumerations were completed for Tulalip, Port Madison, Swinomish, Muckleshoot, Looney, and Yakima in Washington Territory, an enumeration was completed for the Standing Rock Reservation in Dakota Territory and for the Round Valley Reservation in California. In Alaska, following 1880, when only a straight population count was taken and continuing throughout the period during which Alaska remained a territory, the Census Bureau utilized special schedules that allotted room for tribal information specific to Native Alaskans. The 1880 Census Report, Alaska, Its Population, Industries, and Resources, 1880, contains statistics, information, and illustrations about the various tribes and plans of Alaska. Captain Dave Numano was one of the first American Indian census takers for the 1880 census. He was born in western Nevada around 1829. His father was Paiute and his mother was Shoshone. In 1879, the Paiute tribe elected Captain Dave as chief. For this, his tribe would bestow upon him the title of Numana, which means father. In 1880, Superintendent Walker turned to tribal leaders to assist with the count of American Indians, and Captain Dave supervised the enumeration of the Paiute tribes in Nevada. Working in an environment that lacked traditional literacy, Captain Dave improvised for the census by having his enumerators draw pictograms of each home in each village. He would then transfer this information to Notch 6, which he bundled by village and sent to the census office for tallying. In this way, they counted 3,171 people in his tribe. The sticks that you see here are currently the only Indian census sticks in the Smithsonian collection, 
from the 1868 census of the Comanche conducted by the office that would later become the Bureau of Indian Affairs. These are not in Captain Day's census. Captain Day's 1880 census of the Paiute was not published as a final report due to a cut in funding once final numbers were compiled, but some of the statistics most likely made it into the 1885 report on mortality and vital statistics. To honor his many contributions, when the Paiute tribe started a hatchery in 1988 to help recover the endangered fish of Lake Pyramid, they named it, as well as a dam on the Truckee River, after Captain Day's. The 1890 census, which published Captain Day's 1880 work, provided photographs, reports, and statistics on many tribes, including in Alaska, that had never been documented before. <laughs> These reports include information on social customs, dress, economy, and housing situation, and include biographies and portraits of influential American Indians. Some of these tribes have since disappeared or been absorbed into larger groups, making the 1890 report on Indians taxed and Indians not taxed in the United States valuable as one of the few records remaining for these people and their descendants. Although some areas of the report reflected the attitudes of the day, the majority of the reports were written by people from within the tribe, special agents of the Office of Indian Affairs, and several of the leading social scientists and emerging anthropologists of the day. Unfortunately, the schedules for 1890 were destroyed in a fire in 1921, so there is no information on individual American Indians or Alaska Natives from the census beyond that which is in the final reports. And although the final reports don't focus on individuals, they can still help provide valuable information for researching both groups and individuals. For example, Census Bureau headquarters is located in Suitland, Maryland. Looking at the final report for 1890, we see that there were only 44 American Indians living in Maryland that year, with the majority living in Calvert County. From this, I would focus my research in Calvert County to find more resources on historical American Indian populations in Maryland. Another eastern state, Maine, had a slightly larger population of American Indians in 1890, although the report is still less than one page. We can see population distributions within the state with a density in Penobscot County, as well as several economic, social, and agricultural notes. From these notes, we can make assumptions about how the individual may have been making, been making a living, either as a basket weaver, a timberman, or a farmer, or some combination thereof. For Alaska, where the census is always focused on enumeration of Alaska natives, and states with more populous American Indian populations, like out west, similar work can be done, but on a much more granular, granular scale. For example, in the Gila River and Salt River reservations of Arizona, there is far greater information even down to specific locations within larger tribal groups. We can learn about the exact size and location of the land, which may be useful if boundaries have changed, as well as the nature of the environment in addition to economic, social, and agricultural information. For some of these more specific reports, if you know the age and some of the general, other general statistics about your research subject, you may even be able to identify them based on how small the statistics are such as the case with people who can read and write English from the Maricopa tribes of these reservations. Since 1960, when the implementation of computers made the process of identifying individuals from data much easier, this bureau has and continues to employ several methods of data masking to make this no longer possible with modern data. We call this disclosure avoidance. And then, of course, in some cases, mainly in 1890, like with that of Captain Dave and other contributors that were American Indian or Alaska Native, there is even far greater detail of information on the tribes in addition to information on significant individuals. Compared with earlier censuses, like those of 1880 and 1890, which only counted reservations in Indian territory due to later amendments to the Authorizing Census Act, the censuses of 1900 and 1910 accounted for the enumeration of Indian territory and reservations from the beginning. To facilitate this process, enumerators utilized an additional Indian population schedule in areas with large American Indian populations. In addition to the questions asked on the regular population schedule, the Indian population schedules also included questions on tribal affiliation of the individual as well as their mother and father, the individual's proportion of Indian blood, marital status, and questions regarding polygamy, taxes, citizenship, allotments, dwelling type, and in 1910, a question on institutional education. When researching special Indian schedules, they are usually found at the end of the county, but sometimes grouped together at the end of the state. Alaska received special population schedules with a column for tribe and clan for these censuses. The Census Bureau, which received permanent agency funding in 1902, conducted one of its first special surveys, the 1907 census for the state of Oklahoma, 
by special order of President Theodore Roosevelt. A group of 25 census clerks traveled from census headquarters in Washington, D.C. to Guthrie, Oklahoma, to assist with the enumeration. In addition to five supervisors, over 1,400 enumerators worked from July 1st through September 10th, 1907, counting 1,414,177 people in the former Oklahoma and Indian territories. Questions included relationship to the head of the household, color or race, age, and sex. Enumerators were to identify Indians by IN in the color or race column. Freeman J. McClure, a farmer, rancher, politician, member of the state constitutional convention, former census taker for both the Dawes Rolls and the 1900 decennial census, and a member of the Choctaw tribe, was most likely one of these enumerators in 1907, having received a recommendation and appointment. Although Preeman most likely worked as an enumerator, it is impossible to verify his records as the only sur surviving schedules for, from the 1907 census of Oklahoma are those for Seminole County in what was then Indian Territory. The bulletin and final report for the 1907 census is available on the census.gov website. In 1920 and 1930, the Census Bureau did not use separate schedules for American Indians, instead relying on the color or race column for identification. However, in 1930, the statistics of the American Indian population were obtained from the general, general population schedule. For the enumeration of American Indians, instead of asking for the state or country of birth of the parents, the enumerator was instructed to ask whether the person was of full or mixed blood and for the tribe to which he or she belonged. A special tabulation was made of the American Indian population showing age, school attendance, illiteracy, marital condition, and ability to speak English by tribe and blood. The 1930 final reports included one titled, The Indian Population of the United States and Alaska. <clears throat> the schedules for Alaska were once again designed with dedicated columns for tribal information and separately from the general population schedules used in the continental U.S. Additionally, starting in 1900, the Census Bureau of officials found locals, specifically teachers, served as the best enumerators in hard-to-count areas. Teachers became so entrenched as census takers that in 1920, the superintendent of education led the census in Alaska. Seen here with her husband during their 1920 enumeration is Catherine Diakonoff Seller, an Aleut Indian who was born in 1884 on the Aleutian Island of Alaska. A longtime educator, her career started in 1910. In 1920, her husband served as one of the enumerators on Kodiak Island, where Catherine helped as an Aleutian translator. In 1940, Catherine received the assignment to enumerate parts of Kodiak Island once again. <clears throat> From previous experience, the U.S. Census Bureau realized the distances and difficulties of enumerating Alaska's sparse population required significantly more time, and census officials allocated a year for the completion of census schedules. So, despite Census Day falling on April 1, 1940 for the continental U.S., the Census of Alaska commenced on October 1, 1939. This is an important fact to consider when researching Alaska Native records throughout all decades when important life dates fall close to Census Day. In 1950, the U.S. Department of the Interior recognized Catherine's life of public service, and Congress awarded her a medal. In 2017, Alaska honored her with induction into the Alaska Woman's Hall of Fame as an outspoken advocate and strong activist for the rights and culture of her people. In her career, she influenced thousands of adults and children across Alaska. With the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 and subsequent litigation, like Superintendent v. Commissioner in 1935, the established status of American Indians led the Census Bureau and the Department of Commerce to advocate that they be fully counted on the general population schedule starting in 1940. This position was solidified in a letter from the solicitor of the Department of the Interior on November 7, 1940, and in a letter by the solicitor of the Department of Commerce on November 9th. The U.S. Attorney General confirmed this on November 28, 1940, when in a letter to the Secretary of Commerce, he said that the matter must be passed to Congress with President Roosevelt's approval. Although the question was technically demurred to the representatives from each state, each state wanted to count as many people as possible to maintain apportionment power, meaning the position of the Census Bureau and the Department of Commerce to include all American Indians became a practical reality. The Census Bureau conducted one additional special census of American Indians, however, when they included an additional schedule to the decennial enumeration of some reservation areas in 1950 at the behest of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. However, this will not be released to the public until 2022, following National Archives and Records Administration data release guidelines. 
NARA, who takes responsibility of census records after final completion of tabulation and reports, is currently working on the release plans for April 1, 2022, where the 1950 decennial census and the 1950 census of American Indians will have dedicated websites for accessing the records. If you're excited for the 1950 census and want to get started early, you can access the final reports at census.gov, or the enumeration maps that the Census Bureau used in 1950 are available at the National Archives and Record Administration's website under the Enumeration District and Related Maps 1880 to 1990 collection, where you can see what the area looked like in 1950 and find enumeration districts if you know where the subject of your research lived at that time. In 1960, the schedule required enumerators to fill in bubbles rather than write in those entries, and the columns for detailed tribal information for Native Alaskans were removed and replaced with two bubbles to mark that that person was a loot or Eskimo, similar to the way American Indians were recorded on the population schedule with a single option. The widespread implementation of the mail-in census questionnaire in 1970 meant race and tribal affiliation became self-reported and no longer relied on the opinion of the enumerator, leading to a steady increase in the populations of American Indians and Alaska Natives in the ensuing decennial counts. In 2000, the recognized American Indian population experienced a significant increase when the census questionnaire included multiracial identification for the first time. Although the statistics of American Indians and Alaska Natives are included in all population reports throughout this period, the Census Bureau has also issued separate reports or bulletins with American Indian and Alaska Native statistics with each decennial census. <clears throat> to access those final reports, the 1880 Census Report on Alaska, the 1890 Census Report on American Indians in Alaska, and all other final reports, visit www.census.gov slash prod slash www slash decennial The 1940 decennial census is available at the National Archives website, 1940census.archives.gov. However, you can only search by location and not by name. Online sites like Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.org, Genealogy.com, or MyHeritage.com have supplanted searching through rows of names for individuals on microfilm to find individual decennial census records. For those who are unable or don't want to buy a subscription to one of these sites, many public libraries provide access to these services free of charge. Contact your local library to inquire if it has subscribed to one of these services. If you want to research by the old school method, please visit NARA's website, which has information on using microfilm roles of census schedules and the Soundex indexing system, which has been essentially rendered obsolete by the methods I mentioned earlier making them harder to find at libraries and repositories. Thank you for joining me today. If you would like to learn more about census history, please visit www.census.gov slash history. For all of the Census Bureau's publications, you can visit census.gov slash library slash publications.html, or if you're interested in current census statistics, please visit data.census.gov. My contact information is listed here, and if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much, uh, and back to you, Lacey. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we have a lot of really engaged data users on this presentation, so um, thank you. This was a wonderful presentation. It generated a lot of great questions. I'm going to give you a break for a second and just answer a couple of them um, so you, you can have a little bit of a break from talking. Um, one of the questions that we have is, do tribal reservations change over time? Um, and then also do we have geographic information about tribal trust? Um, and we do. So tribal um, reservations can change over time. There's a, there are a lot of different reasons for that. And we do have information about tribal trust. Um, the best source for that is going to be our TIGER database, which is, um, host, you know, contains all of the shape files we have for the country, which certainly includes um, all of the geographies we've discussed today. Um, if you're looking for an actual shape file, if you just need to kind of look at the geography and have more of an overview, Tiger Web is also available. They're both on census.gov. You can also Google both of them. They're easy to find. Um, one more question that's easy for me to answer while you have a break, Chris, is um, was about my tribal area. And it's great that, that many of you are using that. We got several questions about um, my tribal area during this chat. And My Tribal Area is an amazing tool that pulls data from mostly the American Community Survey, um, and it produces a report for one specific tribal area at a time. So the question was, is that tool available to, say, pull every um, data for every tribal area from the country at the same time? My Tribal Area does not do that. It's great for making one really 
awesome report for one area. Um, if you want to pull together multiple geographies, including tribal areas, data.census.gov is your best bet um, to pull in multiple areas and look at different surveys. Um, and there are some webinars on our website at uh, Census Academy that can walk you through how to use data.census.gov. Um, thank you, Lisa. We had a couple questions about if this would be posted and where. Um, so we will post the recording, the transcript, and the presentation as well um, on the link that Lisa provided to you. And Chris, if you've had a chance to breathe, I have a couple follow-up questions that I would love to throw your direction if you still have the energy. Um, the first one was, where can people find images from, this was specifically the 1890 census, um, but in general, where would you find images of past or historical censuses? Um, we are actually working on making those more easily accessible, but right now you would have to access um, one of the links I provided to our decennial publications and go to the 1880 or 1890 um, reports and uh, actually just pull them out. Uh, the, the entirety of the report is online, um, so you can actually just go through and essentially read through the book and find the images uh, within those uh, volumes. Awesome. Um, there was a question about are Native Hawaiians included um, in the, the data that you were just walking through, or is that a, a separate tabulation for historical purposes? No, no, that, yes, that would be as part of uh, Asian and Pacific Islander, uh, they, they, they fall under that group. Okay, perfect. And then and, last and but not least. And if there's interest in more information about Hawaii, we can talk about another webinar for that. <laughs> I, and I was going to say, it's probably, it's probably a good idea, right? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of material to cover here, so that might be a, a separate conversation. Um, and then last but not least, if you wanted to, if somebody wanted to go back and look at censuses, like each decennial census, and what was asked and what data is available from each of those, what would be their best source and best place to go look for that information? Uh, if you're looking for just the questions that were asked, uh, I would go to census.gov slash history. We have uh, several sections that outline the different elements of each census, uh, including just a section for the questions, uh, and there, there's also overviews that will provide uh, what data was provided. I would okay. recommend census.gov slash history for historical uh, census information. Yeah, and as somebody who's gone to that website, it's, it's a really, it's a cool place. It's got a lot of of rich information about how this has changed over decade to decade. A lot of people chimed in with, yes, please, more information about Native Hawaiians. So, Chris, I think that you have a, <laughs> your, next, your next request officially. Um, with Sounds that, there are a couple – what was that? that just, sounds good. <laughs> okay, yeah. With that, there were a couple of specific questions. Um, we have one about – specific tribes and specific areas and specific data points, we will, we have this chat record. We will reach out to you individually. Um, so please know that we'll reach out to you in the next couple of days. But with that, um, I think that covers all of the questions we have here. Thank you so much, Chris, for doing this. Um, we always enjoy your presentations, and I'm so thankful that you are willing to do these for us. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, operator. All right. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.